Thank you, Pavel. Let's switch to English so we're more professional. Hi, guys. I'm glad that you all came. That's what she said. Uh, my name is Andre Martinak, and I'm a senior Android developer at Vacuum Labs. And today I'll be talking about Kotlin multi-platform or cross-platform development in general. So to make things faster, yeah, this is the synopsis. I'll be talking more in depth about Kotlin multi-platform. I'll be showing you some code if everything works, and there'll be some space for your questions and answers. But before we begin, I would like to make a small poll so I know like the distribution of platforms here. So please raise your hand up if you're using Android as your daily driver or your device. Okay, thanks, thanks. Okay, now, well, that's good for you, nice. Uh, now raise your hands if you're using uh, iPhone or iPads or iOS. Nice, so it's like 50-50 distribution. I was expecting this, nice, great. Is there someone else who wants to raise their hands, like someone with a flip phone or vi Windows or Blackberry? No one, or Huawei, yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, I have some data here to make the presentation in interesting, so I use this website, uh, statcounter.com, which can show you uh, the distribution of Android versus iOS versus other platforms uh, worldwide and in different regions. So if you look at worldwide, you can see that Android has 71% and iOS 27%. If you look at Europe, 67% versus 31%. USA, iOS is winning here, uh, 42 against 57. If you look at Asia, Android is crushing it, 81 compared to 17. So why I'm talking about this, uh, yeah, okay, I could put some Android versus iPhone joke here and like half of you would be like, haha, this aligns with my personality or identity so I find it funny, but the other half would be talking more like, mm, I like the other platform more and therefore I won't laugh, you handsome guy standing on the stage. <laughs> So I'm not going to be do, doing these jokes because, as you saw, Android is superior, but no, just, just kidding. Um, at, at the end of this presentation, I would like you to be to feeling like the iOS developers and the Android developers to feel like we're on the same boat. We want to create great experiences for the users on one platform, and we want to make it as streamlined as possible. So, okay, let's talk about cross-platform app development in general real quick. We're gonna talk about some advantages, disadvantages, and what are the current options. Why would you want to use cross-platform development? So as you saw, and as we can see that there's a big distribution between these two platforms, if you are a startup or a company and you want to reach a wide audience, you definitely want to cover both platforms, right? So one way to do it is to hire native developers for iOS or Android, which is really expensive. We are expensive. And so it, um, if you decide to use cross-platform, you can reach wider audiences and you can save a lot of resources. Your team can be smaller, which means you save your resources. Okay, another advantage here, there are more advantages, but I just want to talk about this real quick, is that it's easier for maintenance. There's probably, okay, I put an asterisk there because there's probably some guy here who's thinking like, Okay, this dude clearly doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about because he clearly hasn't tried to maintain a three-year-old three, three year old React Native project, but yeah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> okay, we have some more disadvantages here. Usually, if you are using some cross-platform framework or SDK, there's some kind of a bridge between the, the OS and the layer that you are working on. So this could cause some performance issues. This could cause some stability issues. It doesn't have to, but uh, I've heard from experience of other developers that this happens. And another thing that I'm interested in is that uh, the user, user experience might suffer. Um, it's because you need to follow standards or guidelines for each platform, either it's iOS or Android or web. And if you, for example, use a date picker from iOS on Android or vice versa, the users are confused and this is not really good for the user experience. So you might uh, need to adjust the, uh, the presentation layer 
and, and this is like this takes a bit more resources as we were talking about before. Okay, let's talk real quick about current options. Okay, I picked these four because I think or my research showed that these are the most used ones currently. Number three, yeah, Ionic and Xamarin are just honorable mentions because uh, I don't know anything about these two, so I won't talk about them that much. And I've heard so that uh, Xamarin is even like a dying grandpa of cross-platform uh, development frameworks. Okay, let's talk about uh, React Native and Expo. Do we have some React Native developers in the house or React developers in the house? Just one, <laughs> all right. Okay, so if you use React for web, um, I think it's a no-brainer that you want, might want to use a React Native for your app or for the mobile development. Um, you can use your React components there. You can share a lot of logic that you've written already in JavaScript or TypeScript, your classes, the model, the business logic, everything. And Expo is basically a wrapper, let's say, around React Native that allows you to develop the apps really fast and um, it's great for prototyping, it's great to, for creating quick uh, apps. Uh, if you want to use some uh, device-specific sensors or APIs, this is a complication, but you can always, they call it eject from the Expo wrapper and go deeper into the React Native. So that, that's the number one. Number two is Flutter. Flutter is also quite young, but not as young compa compared to Kotlin multi-platform. Um, Flutter is developed by Google, which for me is a red flag, but uh, we won't talk about that. Flutter is working, my understanding of Flutter is that uh, it creates something like a gaming engine, a canvas that it draws the components and everything on, so everything should be really smooth and fast. You can have like 60 FPS animations there, so it's great if you want to have some animation heavy apps. Um, it uses programming language uh, called Dart. It's a programming language, it's an open source language and it's developed by uh, Google as well. It's not very, um, it's not very used or how do you say, like widespread be between the developers. Um, they told me a few years ago on a conference that they, they're going to have lots of great, great uh, features like coroutines, no safety and these nice things that Kotlin already has. Uh, but it was a while ago, um, and it looks a bit JavaScript-ish, I would say, to me. Kotlin multi-platform, we'll talk about that more. That's why we're here. Okay, Kotlin multi-platform, as the name suggests, allows you to use Kotlin, this amazing programming language that makes developers so happy for almost any platform. So uh, for JVM, you can use it for JVM, JavaScript, or native. Um, if you decide to use JVM, you, you'll be able to deploy your apps for Android, obviously. And you can do back backend server apps and desktop apps. In JavaScript, you'll be able to do front-end apps. I saw that you can use like a React wrapped in Kotlin. I'm not the pro in this area, but it looks really interesting. But this uh, JavaScript part is, I think, is the least developed at this moment. And then you have the native part where you can create iOS applications and desktop apps for all the platforms on desktop, Mac, Windows, and Linux. Yeah, as I said, Kotlin is amazing. Uh, it makes the developers really happy. Do we have some Kotlin devs here? I hope more than React Native. One, two, three. Oh, four. just four. Okay, how many developers do we have here in the house? Can you please raise your hands? Wow, okay, all right. So I, I guess you're more uh, JavaScript and TypeScript and Rust developers. Okay, Kotlin is getting there. I have a fellow Android developer, my friend, who be, uh, became recently a father. And we were talking the other day about stuff, how was the baby and so on. And he still told me that transition between Java and Kotlin was the best thing that happened in his life. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Okay, since I'm a Kotlin multi-platform, or sorry, since I'm a mobile developer, I will be talking about the Kotlin multi-platform part. Uh, Kotlin multi-platform mobile, uh, KMM, is a 
a subpart of Kotlin multi-platform that's focused mostly on development of the Android and iOS apps since they are the most used ones. How it works is that as it suggests, or as you can see on the, on the, on the slide, on the, on the picture, you develop a business logic and core at, in, in one spot, and then it's distributed between the platforms. You can use it on uh, Android and iOS apps, uh, as I'm going to show you hopefully in the code, uh, if everything works, works, works as it was supposed to. And uh, of course, sometimes you need to be able to use like iOS or Android specific APIs in the code and Kotlin multi-platform allows you to do this. I will show you how. And the, the whole, pro whole process is quite streamlined, I'd say it's very nice. It has some advantages, some disadvantages. Let's talk about those. So I'm an Android developer, so I'm heavily biased, I would say. But if you're an Android developer and you use Kotlin multi-platform mobile, then as they say on their website, like you get a new tool that you can use to build new stuff, build uh, iOS apps or maybe web apps. So you don't need to like change the whole toolbox. Like for example, if you, if you decided to use Flutter, if you use Flutter, you need to use a different programming language and uh, the whole ecosystem is different. But here you use Kotlin that you're used to. And if you are used to working with some libraries like uh, Ktor or Firebase, Realm, SQLite, these are all uh, libraries that are, have been uh, or were before on Android, but now they're migrated to Kotlin uh, purely. So you can use those, so you're used to it. Or you can use uh, Coin, which is great for dependency injection. So it's not that difficult to actually extend uh, what you have and reach the other platform. What you need is uh, a UI developer or, or developer that will do the UI on the other platform. So you do the business logic in the core in Kotlin, and then you take an uh, iOS developer who will just take the shared code, shared business, and create the UI in, uh, let's say, Swift UI or the former, former thing that you guys used to, used to use. And that's it. Uh, about the UI, hmm, there's this new thing in Android's world called Jetpack Compose. It's, uh, it's a descriptive way or declarative way how to create UI. It's very, it's, they call it reactive, but it's very similar to what React Native or React uses. So once you learn that, or, and you, everything clicks in your hand, and you, like you, so you, you shift to this paradigm, it's quite easy, I think, to learn also React, Flutter, and SwiftUI. So what could happen is that you have a, a decent Android developer who will create the whole uh, business logic in core, then he'll do the Jetpack Compose UI in Android and he'll learn how to do Swift UI and you might still need less developers than you would need if, if the whole app would be built in, 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 on iOS. Okay, will be, the Compose multi-platform here is mentioned uh, because um, it's kind of related. It's, uh, it is also developed by JetBrains. JetBrains is also uh, the company that's developing uh, Kotlin but Kotlin is open source, but they are managing it. So Compose multi-platform, their vision is to, uh, to, be, to provide some SDK for developers that will be able to create UIs with, on one spot for web, uh, JVM, maybe native, we'll see. But currently they support JVM and, desktop, uh, and web. So you can create UIs in Compose multi-platform on one spot and share th this logic between also uh, other platforms. Okay, I have, I didn't talk about the disadvantages and there are disadvantages. You might even see that in the, in the code when I show you. <clears throat> so what's really bad about Kotlin multi-platform mobile is that the configuration is quite difficult. Mm, if you want to do some changes there, like lots of, it wouldn't compile, or you, you cannot load a lot of libraries, or just Gradle doesn't work with you, and then you have to like combine it with Cocoa. I don't know how to, how to, how to say it in, how it's Cocoa in, on, in the iOS world. Uh, so like configuring, configuring this pain. Uh, then <clears throat> you need a Mac machine. So you need a MacBook if you want to develop for Kotlin multi-platform. So you need to use Xcode. And the iOS developers here know uh, what it means uh, using Xcode. Um, 
maybe I will run it too. Uh, I have a M1 silicon chip. This creates another layer of problems, why it doesn't work. So this whole ecosystem is like just, uh, they are tweaking it, it's getting better and better. You can use Android Studio or IntelliJ IDEA to develop it and Xcode. Uh, let me just check whether I, if I haven't forgotten any advantages. Because, oh yeah, I forgot to mention this one, one big disadvantage, uh, which is concurrency or developing concurrency is not a good time uh, in Kotlin multi-platform. Like if you want to do some uh, communication between threads or anything like that, you can, it's gonna cost you, cost you some, cause you some problems. You cannot use coroutines, which, are, which you can use in Kotlin or in Android everywhere. <clears throat> Everything works on one main thread in the iOS, and that's because the memory management module is, or the memory management is different on iOS. So they're tweaking it right now at this moment to make it work. Some example of this problem is that, um, you know, in Kotlin you can use this uh, keyword object, which creates you basically a singleton class, which is in Java. And what can happen when you like, uh, want to get, get this object from different threads is that you get two different instances, which is not a single <laughs> Okay. Right. Yeah, uh, the advantage that I forgot to mention is that you get native performance in the apps, which is great, so there's no hiccups, it's not sluggish. It's like you would be just developing a native app which is not the case for React Native, let's say. And another advantage is that because of this, um, because of fact, the fact that you are creating UI for Kotlin multi-platform or for the, plat or for the platforms uh, like extra, you get really good user experience because you're developing it the way it should be. So there's no confusion between the, the, the presentation layer. All right. This is another possible disadvantage for you. Kotlin multi-platform consists of a lot of components and some of them are stable, some of them are in beta, some of them are in alpha. So that's why currently they say that Kotlin multi-platform is in alpha version. Uh, they promised us that this spring it will be beta, but a few weeks ago they released a a blog post which said that they're postponing to autumn this year, latest autumn, and that's because they want to tweak the memory management as I was talking about. I'm not sure whether the real issue is that the half of JetBrains or a lot of JetBrains developers is Russian. I don't know. But you can say that uh, if you want to use, or you will be using Kotlin multi-platform when you like bleeding edge or if you like want to live on the edge, you use it and I mean, using stable is just boring. Like if you're using alpha, it's like playing life on, on hard difficulty or nightmare. So you get more, more experience, it's much more fun, I'd say. Yeah, stable is for pussies. <laughs> Uh, you might be asking, hey, you on the stage, who is using Kotlin Multiplatform? It's so new and who would use it? So we have these big names here, but when you see Netflix, it does not mean that the Netflix app is written in Kotlin Multiplatform. They just used it for um, their internal project. They wrote a nice blog post about it, but there's a lot of apps that, or open source apps that already use it. We also use it. I work for this, um, German startup in stealth mode, yes, uh, and uh, they decided to use it. So they were able to, to talk to their investors and maybe the, uh, the government, uh, I don't know, uh, that they, will be, they can be able or they can use alpha version yet. We'll see. Okay. Uh, you might ask, what do you usually put into the shared code, into the common module? And this, is, I guess this is not a big surprise. The survey is from the first and second quarter of 2021. This is something that, they, that is on their website right now. And the, uh, the inquiry or the survey said that most people are using it for networking, for persistence, data storage, for logging, 
of course, algorithms, computations, this is the business logic, state management. Because, like, if you think about it, I don't know about you guys, but 90% of the apps that I worked on in history, even today, is like you just communicate with the API, with the server, which sends you some information and you like adjust it or do some small operations with it. But uh, this is a no-brainer. Like you put everything in one spot and both apps use it the same way and use the same objects, same classes. And now even if you use Kotlin properly, and if you like use the reactive like flows, state flows and all these nice new features, you'll be able even to put the view models there, which is amazing to me. Like uh, you, you take view models, put them into the shared code and use them throughout the app. It's great. Okay, now to the code showcase. Uh, showcase, sorry. Uh, when you create a new project in Android Studio or IntelliJ IDEA, it creates you these modules. The common module is the module that sh um, is the shared code, and it provides the classes to the other parts. You can have like the iOS, JVM, in our case, it, this will be Android, and uh, it utilizes all, all these other modules. So let me set up the Android Studio. Jak jsme na tom s časem? Jsi to někdo? Okay. okay, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Can you see the, the code? Okay. So I'm going to first show you the, the structure of the project. Just give me a sec. So, when you create this project, you get these uh, modules. You get an Android app, which is the Android app that utilizes the SDK. You got the iOS app, self-explanatory, I guess. Then you get this common module, which has the build gradle configuration file source. And then here you have common main, which holds all the shared logic. So all the domain classes, model classes, use cases, interfaces, everything that's going to be used throughout the, the other, uh, the Android and iOS apps. Then we have here the common test. Where you put the tests of the common self-explanatory, then you have the iOS part and the Android part. Uh, we'll get to this. So I want to show you first, uh, I've created this in common main, I've created this model package or uh, directory. And since we are a fintech company, we're going to create a bank account. So it's a simple class. It's a bank account which has a name uh, in an IBAN, big bit, and balance. So uh, I've created this uh, class here in common main, and you can use it in both of the apps. So if I open here the Android app, I open the main activity, activity here. We are in the in the. This is the, the pure Android part, the code, uh, which utilizes the library. I can just create a account here, and just work with it this way. Name, main account. Yeah, something like this. So here we are. Here we are. We created this bank account, and we can maybe just show. I can just show you that it won't fail when I do this. Uh, Okay, I'm running an emulator here, an Android emulator, and I'm running, whoa, 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 not this, no, 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 okay. You haven't seen anything, it's very proprietary. Yeah, so I ran the app and it just says the main account. Okay, so here we are in the, in the, in the part of the Android. <sighs> okay, now I'm going to open Xcode. Wish me luck. Xcode. So I can do it this way. 
So if I go to where the application is installed, here you, you see the Android app, this is the common, and here we have the iOS app, and if you open the iOS app, you can see the Xcode project uh, file. So we open that. It opens the code here. So uh, here we are in some basic screen. Uh, we chose the content. Uh, let me just try to initialize the bank account here as well. And I'm not an iOS developer, so you, I might need your, some of your help. Whoa, nice. Oh, okay, it's not that bad. Mm. This is the boring part. So here, here we have some text. We add another text and we show again uh, the account and its name. Okay, let's build this. So this is utilizing the uh, Kotlin multi-platform as an SDK and We'll be running a simulator here. iPod Touch. Doesn't look like an iPod to me, but okay. Wow, nice. The, the, the text is not there, so that's great. Ah, finally, okay, I don't know what happened. So this is the thing about Kotlin Multiplatform. Some things are super undeterministic, like it works before the presentation and it does this. But okay, here we say that uh, we can utilize the, the class. Okay, let's close this uh, software. Okay, uh, another like, very important thing about Kotlin Multiplatform is the expect actual pattern. Um, it's in cases when you want to use some platform specific uh, implementation in the common code, uh, so you use a expect keyword, an actual keyword in, uh, in the platforms. I'll show you in this example, for example. So you want to, most of the times when you're working with decimal numbers, you, want, you don't want to use doubles uh, or like what you receive from the backends is mostly strings. So. Uh, you want to create a decimal number, for example, like this. Uh, I have, uh, so you, put, you use this expect class, call the name, some constructor, how it's constru constructed, and then you define the behavior here. It's basically like interface in Java. So I have defined these uh, plus, minus, times, and division, uh, and we will be using a decimal number as an argument, and it will return another decimal number. So you first define this in the common module, and I can close this and make this a little bit better. Nice. And I have already prepared before the presentation implementation of these, this decimal number for each platform. So if we go to Android first, uh, I'll just show you where we are. So here we are in the Android main model and decimal number. So what you do is that you create an actual class decimal number and you need to implement all the operations that were expected of you. Since we're in the Java world or JVM world, we want to use big decimal. Maybe you're familiar with it. And this is a nice hack that we can have an internal constructor for this platform, which uses big decimal. And for the actual constructor, we just take the string value and parse it to big decimal. Uh, and so this is just a basic implementation of plus, minus, times, and division. I've implemented here the equals function for the tests. Now we're back at the common, and we want to see the iOS implementation of this. So this is, I think it's mind blowing that here you're writing Kotlin code, but you're using uh, Swift or Objective-C classes. This is some, this is black magic to me, but um, this, uh, these classes here are wrapped for Kotlin, so you can you can use it this way. And uh, yeah, we, 
in, on iOS, we decided to use n as decimal number. So you implement all the other operations as well, and you're good to go. So this is the actual, uh, the sorry, expect actual pattern. I can show you another example that was created, in, uh, like when you create a project. So if you go to common, and here we have platform. So we create a class that's called platform, which will hold the name of the platform we're currently working with, and each of the platforms, Android and iOS, uh, returns a different string. Here we can use the Android build version and you can, it will return Android 12, for example. And if you go to the iOS, here you, you use the UI device class. So this will return, return uh, iOS and the system version. What is nice is that you can create tests for the common, purely for the common, and uh, it will run, you can run the common tests on both platforms. So you can be sure that you define this, this unit test for like this abstract uh, behavior and you test both of the platforms uh, separ separately. So let's do that. Okay, I'll open the common main, common test, model. Oh yeah, I've, I've already done this, okay. So we're in the common test uh, package and we create just this simple test where we just do some addition of these two numbers. This is the expect, expected result. And this is uh, the assertion of Kotlin test plan, uh, framework. What I will do though, is that I'm going to on purpose, I'm sorry, this is just random, but I'm going to destroy the Android implement, uh, iOS implementation for the equals, let's say here. Um, to always return false. So when we will be comparing these two ob objects, they will never be the same. Uh, I have to run a simulator for, in order to run tests uh, for uh, iOS. Open simulator. Format. And meanwhile, I will open the Android, sorry, Android decimal number. Yeah, here, no, not here. So this is the test in common, and I can here decide where I want to run it. So I can run it either on Android or iOS. So I'll first run it in Android, and this should work because uh, 1.5 plus 2.5 should be four. Hopefully, if not, I might be I might get fired from Wacom Labs. Okay, the test passed. Do we have this device running? Yes, yes, we do. So if you, now this is the unfortunate part, but I have to open the I have to run the test through this uh, com command line. So this is where I'm going to run the iOS test, and it should fail. Please fail. Yes. <laughs> Failed test. If I open the, open the, the description of the, of the test, it's not here. No, I'm clicking the wrong link. Everything's so big on this screen. Uh, where is it, where is it? Depends on. Oh, never mind. Well, basically, you, know, you, you can see that uh, since I did, I've butchered, butchered the iOS part, um, the implementation here, the test is failing. And when we go back here and make it work the way we, it should, that it compa uh, compares these two values, and we run the test again, please don't fail, please don't fail. Yes, it failed. Nice. Uh, so maybe we need to compile it first. Yeah, these are the things that we were fighting every day. Like, it runs on one dev device, but it doesn't run on my colleague's device. 
or it the tests work on my machine, but they don't work on CI. So these are the disadvantages for now for multi-platform. But if you're patient, I think it's worth it. We're building, building. <clears throat> Okay, never mind. Something's wrong with the configuration. Bad CPU type in executable. Oh, okay. I was running the wrong Gradle command, probably. So now it's running. So this was just the basics that I wanted to show you. Well, basically the actual or expect uh, pattern is like it's like when your girlfriend expects you to take out the trash, or when I'm looking at the crowd, maybe your imaginary girlfriend wants to take out the trash, and what you actually do is play the games. On, in front of a TV and she comes home and she sees your naked ass in front of the TV. That's the test that you haven't done like I, I did in the common. Okay. And that's it for me. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you might have some questions. So if you want to uh, like talk, talk more, I'll be standing somewhere there. Just don't, don't hesitate to reach me. And if you have some quick questions, we can discuss it right now. And thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Any questions? Feedback? Ivan? No. Why are you waving at me? Okay. Uh, before we break, question. So do you use Android phone? Sorry? Do you use Android phone? Yes. And how does it work with your Apple? It works nicely because Android is an open platform which works with everything. <laughs> it's not the closed ecosystem. <laughs> but it's developed by, by Google. Yeah, that, a yeah, it is a red flag, but uh, it's better than Huawei. <laughs> Maybe second question, do you have some bad projects on the Android? Some bad projects? Yes. Uh, you mean that use uh, Kotlin multi-platform? In general, right? so you're still your Android developer. Bad projects. Hmm? Not bad, I mean bad. Bad projects, ah, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nice pass, okay. I have this uh, application um, done for example for now in Android that's used for accepting payments in cryptocurrencies. Uh, I've done this purely in Android, but now I'm migrating to Kotlin multi-platform mm -hmm. and it's called Moonpulse. So if you're a fan of cryptocurrencies and if you want to like accept payments at your small business or something like this, a cafeteria, uh, you can use it or reach, reach out to me. We can, we can talk about cryptocurrencies in general. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> And last question to the audience. So in case you, we will organize some hackathon or whatever to code with our guys, would you be interested? So please, can you show me? Does it, does it make sense? Would you code with us? Hmm. No? Ever? Someone? Is it a, a crypto hackathon or no. a hackathon in general? So in general, would you code with us? Yeah. Nice. And crypto? Yes. Less people, okay. Well, it's like, it, like in reali reality, who uses crypto <laughs> compared? <laughs> okay. okay, so let's break for five minutes and then we'll continue. Yeah, thank you very much for the attention, guys. <laughs>